Introduction Largely overlooked due to predating the Civil War by just over a decade, the Mexican-American War illustrated the passionate zeal the American public had at the time for territorial expansion, significant not only in the land it opened up for Americans, but also the people it brought onto the national stage. Robert E. Lee and Winfield Scott, who both played major roles in the Mexi Mexican-American War, would go on to play major roles in the momentous Civil War, this time on opposite sides. Jeff Scherer has gone for soldiers, explores in greater depth the intricacies of the Mexican-American War that textbooks fail to cover. From the disputed boundary of Texas to the exile of Santa Ana, Scherer covers it all. Background Information Gone with Soldiers is a non-fiction narrative and understandably so. There is no way historians will have all the conversations among commanders and soldiers of this war documented. And that's where the author's creative capabilities come into play. Although the speech of the characters is a little too modern for my liking, Jeff Scherer does a wonderful job of creating a historically based story that illustrates the development of many important characters and how they are shaped into the historically significant figures they'll become during the upcoming Civil War. It must also be noted that Scherer wrote this book as a prequel to his much heralded trilogy on the Civil War. Gone for Soldiers gives Scherer an opportunity to provide his audience with the experiences that helped to shape his characters up to the pivotal Civil War. Gone for Soldiers illustrates the growth of figures like Robert E. Lee, from General Winfield Scott's inexperienced engineer to commander of the Con Confederate Army many years later. With that, let's begin an overview of the novel. Summary The novel centers around the plight of engineer Robert E. Lee, who graduated from the West Point Military Academy and is now taking his first plunge into the field as General Scott's engineer. He immediately shows great leadership skills to his general, as well as ingenuity during the, the Siege of Veracruz. Word reaches the Scott camp of General Zachary Taylor's victory over Santa Ana at Buena Vista. Despite celebrations over the important win, Taylor suffered many losses, and as a result is no longer able to supply Scott's army with soldiers. As the war rages on, Lee has risen to the second-ranking engineer, with only John L. Smith above him, who has now been ill for weeks. Lee is then sent out on a scouting expedition with a man by the name of Fitzwalter, on a journey that proves perilous because of the intense Mexican presence and the inability of the Americans to come and rescue them if they encounter any danger. Lee takes the challenge head-on despite the risk to his own life. After a close encounter with a group of Mexican soldiers that was barely avoided, Lee and Fitzwalter made their way back to the American camp with more valuable territory mapped out. Shara now transitions into part two of the novel. The army is now creating a crude roadway through the hills Lee had found on his expedition to move the field cannons through. As the army is battling through the conditions and minor threats of organized Mexican bands, Shara takes an opportunity to view the shortcomings from the Mexican camp. Santa Ana centers this part of the novel. Shara immediately portrays him as a man who is only interested in living life lavishly. Surrounded by a magnificent breakfast of various meats, berries, and cheeses, all while cursing his chef's incompetence for allowing his bread to go stale. Santa Ana quickly becomes involved with the movement of General Scott's troops, commanding the utmost in respect from his soldiers. Meanwhile, the Americans are starting to organize into offensive positions to begin their assault on the Mexicans' El Telegrafo. The Americans achieved a noteworthy victory that would go on to be named the Battle at Cerro Gordo, resulting in a resounding win for the Americans as the Mexicans were forced to retreat. However, it is also one of the first instances of the character sees Lee exposed to the terrors of combat, particularly highlighting his reaction upon the viewing of a comrade bleeding out and trying to do all he could to keep him alive, even though he knew there was no hope for him. Scott captured a bevy of prisoners, giving him significant leverage in the case of any diplomatic coming together. The American forces have now settled in the city of Perot in an effort to build a beneficial trade relationship with the natives. As the relationship between Scott and Poe continues to deteriorate, Lee goes about advising Scott in every way possible. The Americans continued on their trek towards Mexico City. Scott scouts ahead with a band of soldiers to take account of the Mexican cannons. Lee comes face to face with the soon to be called General Stonewall Jackson. Jackson emphatically takes command of a brigade when General Preston Johnston is killed in combat, yelling out orders to the men as if it was second nature to him. The scene shifts back to Santa Ana and the state of affairs in the Mexican camp. He evaluates the Mexican position at the moment, all while feasting on the delicacies his chefs prepared for him. He starts to question whether his, whether his authority upon his subjects is waning. 
as the support of the public is the only real power he has as a dictator. He decides to retreat his troops when the Americans break through Gabriel Valencia's forces. Santa Ana makes his retreat through the Cherubusco River with Colonel Riley in hot pursuit. A fierce battle ensues near the river. The Americans again easily overwhelm their Mexican adversaries at the Battle of Cherubusco. The expected celebrations of victory surprise Scott when they do not arrive. A softer side is seen of the soldiers as they gaze out into the distance in solemn remembrance of their fellow brothers who have passed. Scott is bewildered to find out that over a thousand of his own men have succumbed to battle. Shara shows the lasting effect of war on these men, reflected in any modern-day American force. A victory on the battlefield doesn't necessarily translate to a victory for these men as they've lost friends and family in the pursuit of American interests. Scott swears never to fight another battle that carries the risk of him losing so many men. A temporary truce was called between Scott and Santa Ana, as both sides needed the time to recuperate from battle and create new strategies if further conflict were to break out. The truce ended up falling apart within a matter of days. Scott ordered General Worth to Molina to destroy any stores of ammunitions found there. Finally, they captured the mills, but at the huge price of 800 of their own men. The Americans then jumped through the final hurdle to Mexico City by storming the Chapel to Pick Castle. George Pickett led the maneuver up the castle walls. Ulysses S. Grant's forces finally broke through the castle walls. Again, the Americans take many prisoners. Shara also reveals a dark fact about the American army during this war. A multitude of American soldiers were tried and then hanged or marked with a permanent D on their skin for deserter because of their traitorous actions during combat. Those who weren't killed would have to forever live with the shame of betraying their nation in its time of need. American troops broke past Mexican defensive walls to take up a strong position in Mexico City. The scene shifts to panic in the Mexican camp as Santa Ana questions how the Americans were able to find their way in, implying treachery. Santa Ana refuses to sign a treaty even though it has become obvious that the power of the American forces is simply too much, and eventually bows under the pressure. Quite strangely, three occupants of Mexican City approach the American base and request to speak with General Scott. They tell him that Santa Ana has evacuated his military from the city and that they are no longer under dictatorial rule. They request terms of peace with the American forces. Scott agrees to not attack the civilians and the Mexicans continue talks with Trist in Spanish. Once they are gone, Trist reveals to Scott that the Mexicans want Scott as their dictator. Scott appoints John Quitman as military governor of Mexico City. The war was finally over and Lee was anxious to get back to Virginia to his family. The celebrations begin in this resounding victory despite all the odds being against them. Lee is praised for his involvement in the war and is assured that constructive reports will be sent back to Washington, mentioning his large involvement in the war. Shara ends the book emphasizing all the territory America was now able to conquer and fulfill their dream of stretching from ocean to ocean. Analysis Jeff Shara's Gone for Soldiers provides a wonderful analysis of the events of the Amer Mexican-American War in the unique historical form of narrative. He delves deeper than the average American history textbook and adds more depth to the reader's knowledge of the war. The author's examination of the Mexican-American War as a generally underappreciated event in the U.S.'s long and significant history is a true one, and his novel helps shed light on the foundation and details of this war. Most significant was his development of the character of various military leaders, such as Ulysses S. Grant, Thomas Stonewall Jackson, and most importantly, Robert E. Lee. All three of these men would go on to play prominent roles in the upcoming Civil War, so the focus on them in this novel is crucial in developing the story in his more famously known Civil War tr trilogy, the most well-known being Gods and Generals. Reading Gone for Soldiers has stirred interest in me to continue the story and read Shara's Civil War trilogy, something I will consider doing if I have the time. Shara also masters the approach of tackling such an impactful event in American history, such as the Mexican-American War and writing a narrative using historical data. Creating a story is difficult enough, but having to match it up to the real historical events is even harder. The author fulfills both goals in an exemplary manner. 
He brought drama and enthralling action to a historical event that many textbooks failed to even recognize as significant. Instead, ignoring to focus on the forthcoming Civil War. Would this book be worth other students' time? The artistry of Jeff Shera as a historical author doesn't leave me at just recommending this book, but also any other book on any topic which my classmates might feel shady about. He covers a wide variety of topics from the War of 1812 to the Second World War, and his narrative approach to history will maintain minute observations of key details that will help bolster any student's historical knowledge. Zinger my Zinger took a more comical approach to the events from the late 1840s. I made two short comics using the web 2.0 tool at bitstrips.com. The first depicts the threat of yellow fever to both the American and Mexicans, both armies having to maneuver their troops in a hastened fashion in order to avoid the yellow fever season. My second comic focuses on perhaps my favorite scene in the novel, where Santa Ana is sitting at his dining table with copious amounts of fruits, cheeses, meats, and wines, chastising his chef for the staleness of his bread asking God to give him the strength to show that man mercy. It illustrates that history, no matter how grim and somber it can be, can also take a humorous approach. Conclusion Jeff Shera did a fantastic job in covering Winfield Scott's military expedition during the Mexican-American War, and covering the many important events that led up to the defeat of Santa Ana at Mexico City. From the siege on Veracruz to the battle on Churubusco River, Shara made a great effort in covering each topic thoroughly. My understanding of the Mexican-American War has been greatly enhanced, achieving what I believe to be the author's main purpose in writing this novel.